Good morning. I'm Dr. Mike Torres, Interim Director of the Curriculum Frameworks and Instructional Resources Division at the California Department of Education. Today, I'm pleased to be hosting the second of three webinars on the California Digital Learning Integration and Standards Guidance that was adopted by the State Board of Education on May 12th of this year. The intent of the guidance adopted by the State Board is to support effective implementation of technology to foster student learning and address critical areas of instructional focus. Now, while the legislation that called for this guidance was passed when most California schools were providing instruction through distance learning, the State Board of Education and the authors of the document recognized the opportunity to document and strengthen the use of educational technology in all instructional settings. Please note that this document does not constitute new content standards, rather it provides new structures of organization for English language arts, English language development, and mathematics content standards. The intent is to support holistic, and integrated instruction. The title of this webinar is Designing Instruction as the focus is Section A, Implementing Research-Based Digital Learning Practices. Later today, our final webinar will address Section B, Mathematics. Today, you will hear about educators using the International Society for Technology or ISTE standards. While they are not among the content standards adopted by the State Board of Education for California, they are ubiquitous and have been adopted by many educators as they improve their practice around the use of educational technology when implementing California's content standards. It is also important to call out that this adopted guidance does not replace standards and frameworks, and it does not represent a new mandate, and it is not intended to narrow the curriculum. Rather, the intent is to leverage lessons learned during the disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic and support educators to sharpen instructional focus while integrating technology to strengthen in all settings. Today, we are fortunate to have members of our esteemed writing team join us along with panels of guest practitioners who will provide their insights on the implementation of the guidance. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping details. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted later on the CDE Digital Learning and Standards Guidance webpage so that you may return to it or recommend it to others. Also, the chat function is disabled, so please use the Q&A function to post any questions you may have for the presenters and panelists. Now, I'd like to acknowledge the Sacramento County Office of Education, or SCOE, the lead agency charged with developing the guidance. They assembled a highly regarded team of authors for this project. The writing team and SCOE staff have worked tirelessly to shepherd this project to its completion. Please welcome my co-host, Dr. Nancy Herota, Deputy Superintendent of the Sacramento County Office of Education, Richard Collada, Chief Executive Director for the International Society for Educational Tech for Technology and Education, Content Development Team Member Dr. Lorea Martinez, and our panelists, Sonia Mendoza, Mendoza, Instructional Technology Initiative Director, Los Angeles Unified School District, and Sonal Patel, Digital Learning Innovation Coordinator, San Bernardino County Office, uh, County Superintendent of Schools. And now, I'll turn it over to Dr. Herota. Well, good morning. Welcome, and we're just so pleased to be able to share highlights of this document. What I'd like to do is begin by providing a broad overview of the team that we convened to develop this guidance document on behalf of the California State Board of Education and in collaboration with the California Department of Education, the Sacramento County Office of Education, we served as the lead agency to develop the California Digital Learning Integration and Standards Guidance. We developed a very strong organizational structure by contracting with the International Society for Technology and Education, referred to as ISTE, to serve as the lead organization to coordinate the writing team and to develop the final product. We are also working with computer using educators known as Q that has extensive knowledge and expertise working with educators in California. 
We were so fortunate to be able to work with these leading experts at the forefront on the use of technology in education. Additionally, we were pleased to convene a team of nationally recognized experts to address the topics that were included in the legislation. These experts include, for English language arts and English language development, Dr. Hallie Yop and Dr. Nancy Brennelson, who were the lead authors of the ELA ELD framework. We also worked with Dr. Joe Bowler in the area of mathematics and Kathy Ann Williams. Dr. Bowler is also a part of the team convened by the California Department of Education, working on the revisions to the mathematics framework. In the area of digital learning, we, uh, Dr. Catherine Kennedy contributed to the writing of this section and Dr. Douglas Fisher and Dr. Nancy Fry contributed to the assessment section. And with us today, we have Dr. Lorea Martinez who contributed to the section on social emotional learning. Next slide. To develop this guidance document, we convened a distance learning advisory committee that, and we gathered their input from stakeholders, including parents, caregivers, students, to inform the development of this guide. And as you can see on this slide, we had a very extensive team. Our content experts included representatives from AVID, the Mathematics Framework Writing Team, the California Subject Matter Project and Californians Together. We also tapped into educators from school districts in Madera and Modesto, as well as county office colleagues at the, in El Dorado, Imperial, Kern, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Tulare County. Additionally, we worked with professional associations and educational organizations, including the California Charter Schools Association, the California Teachers Association, Policy Analysis for California Education, the Ca Education Trust West and PTA and the California Federation of Teachers. As we worked with the advisory committee, we, they, pr they provided extensive input, not only on the development of this guidance document, but they provided assistance in identifying high quality interactive materials that are included in this guide. And they helped us identify educators to be interviewed that are included in this document as vignettes and voices from the field. And these are embedded throughout the document. Next slide. In addition to working with our, the advisory group, we did conduct expanded outreach and we worked with CSESA's Curriculum and Instruction Steering Committee. And through this effort, we gathered input on the development of this guide with members of the CISC Math Subcommittee, as well as the CISC English Language Arts, English Language Development Subcommittee. Additionally, to amplify the voices of students and parents, we gathered, we partnered with families and schools and Californians for Justice to gather feedback from parents, caregivers, and students from across the state. And this feedback was gathered through both Zoom stakeholder sessions as well as survey feedback. Next slide. This provides an overview of the three sections in the California Digital Learning Integration and Standards Guidance. It, the first section, content section A, which we will be focusing on today, focuses on research-based distance learning principles and practices. And this section is comprised of three key chapters. It includes designing effective and engaging digital learning, assessing student achievement in digital learning, and fostering healthy, equitable, and inclusive digital communities. Sections B and C, which are included in subsequent webinars, focus on standard guidance in content areas. And these sections also include strategies to integrate digital learning focused on content instruction. As I shared with you today, we're focusing on section A and we have Dr. Richard Collada and Dr. Lorea Martinez who will be highlighting these sections. Next slide. As I shared with you, our advisory members and Q and other practitioners provided 
recommendations for educators to be included in this guide. And so throughout this guide, we have an opportunity to hear voices from the field. And these are written summaries of interviews of educators who are pro providing promising practices in the classroom around digital learning. We've included vignettes as well as spotlights to bring this document to life. These illustrative examples really provide key examples of what this work looks like in action. So with this, I, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Richard Collado, who will be highlighting section A. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be here with, with you all and a great uh, summary of the, of the work here, uh, Dr. Rota. So thank you for doing that. Um, I uh, will just talk through what we have presented as part of this section A. And uh, this was done, uh, even though I get to be the one to help present this, it was really done with a great collaboration of all of the groups that uh, you just heard about, and especially with, with some really fantastic partners at, uh, at SCOE. So thank you uh, to all who, who were part of this. The guide really focuses on technology and powered learning. And that's important because it's not just for online learning, though it will help if you're doing all online learning. But these are principles that will be helpful and uh, really solid for all uh, learning environments. And so that's what we'll, we'll uh, take a look at. As we spoke with educators, as we spoke with school leaders, it became clear that there were three topics that really just over and over again came up as areas where we, we could use some help, we could use some guidance. And so that's what we really based this, uh, this around. And those three uh, uh, chapters, actually, let's go one more uh, slide. There we go. We'll start there and then we'll go back. So those three uh, topics were how do we uh, create equity and access. And those are two different, it's important that it's it's an and in there, right? It's equity and access. So just getting access, just getting kids connected does not suddenly make an effective and equitable uh, education experience. Although the connectivity is critical, we, we know that, but we also looked at practices to make sure that they we were creating equitable learning experiences. We also looked at preparing and supporting teachers for digital learning. And then really looking at designing uh, meaningful learning uh, experiences when kids have access to that technology. And so I'm gonna talk through those um, a bit here. Uh, so really what we did <laughs> is we said, what's the secret sauce, right? What is the way, what's the secret sauce to be able to do effective digital online learning? Um, and, and, and I want to share a little bit, and this is all written out, but, but I'm going to give it to you in a, in a formula, right? This is the, the quick summary of, of the uh, uh, materials that we say. So look, if you have a great learning vision and you have prepared teachers and equitable access, you end up with very effective digital learning. But if you take away any of those key elements, we don't end up with the same experience, right? You could have equitable access, we could have devices and bandwidth for every kid in the world, but if we don't have teachers that are prepared to use it well, or a learning vision for how we're going to use these tech tools in effective ways, we don't end up with uh, a, an effective learning environment. And, and like Lays, you could do that the other way too. You could have the, the best vision for how you're going to do effective learning, but if you don't have teachers that are prepared and you don't have equitable access, uh, you're not going to have uh, success. And so really what this document outlines is when we have a vision for learning, when we have prepared teachers and equitable access, we end up with uh, highly effective, engaging digital learning experiences. And so so that's the, the gist of what we have here. Now, uh, I want to dive into it a little bit more than that. And in chapter one, uh, we pay particular attention to how we make sure those teachers are prepared for this new world. It is a very different uh, world that we're in. Even, even if we're back in classrooms, it's still very different being with the, the new tools, the tech tools that we have at our, our hands. And I can't stress this enough. We have seen that a lot of schools have focused on, uh, again, making sure that the technology is available, uh, but they have not spent nearly enough time making sure teachers are prepared to use these tools in transformational ways. Uh, and so throughout this document, we give a whole variety of examples of professional development activities that we can do to help our teachers not just move their, uh, you know, 
worksheets to a digital space, right? But actually use the technology in a way uh, that is that is really powerful. One of the ways that we suggest to do this is that we have shared uh, a series of um, uh, ac activities, uh, areas of focus to call out as you're thinking about uh, your teacher professional learning. Uh, one of these, and I'll get, I'll talk to each of these in a little more detail. One of these focuses on the fact that there are national standards to guide this work. Uh, we don't have to invent the wheel from scratch. We don't have to, to come up with this all on their own. There are some frameworks that can be very helpful. And, and I'll talk more about those in just a second. We also talk about the fact that there are uh, important professional responsibilities, roles that have the teacher does not have to be the one presenting all of the content all the time in a virtual world when there's access to high quality digital materials at our fingertips. But the teacher presence and their, their role is critical in making sure that there is uh, an inclusive and effective learning environment. It also means that we can tap into expertise that is not physically co-located, right? We can be smart about using this to tap into experts and peers for, for the students from all parts of the world and bring them into our class environments. And then finally, we talk about digital citizenship, and uh, we'll get to that a little bit more. I'll share an example of that uh, and the value of data. So when, you, when we have technology, one of the things that comes along with that is the ability to have much more data that we can use to make decisions about our learning. Uh, and so, so again, more, more details are, are included in the, in the guide, but I'll, I'll share some more about that in, in just a second. Let's talk for a minute about the, uh, the first part, which are our national standards. We've highlighted two sets of uh, national standards. Um, let's go to the next slide if we can. Uh, there we go. The two that we've highlighted are the ISTE standards, and these are really uh, effective for helping guide. And, and to be clear, these are not curricular standards. They are, they are guides for effective use of technology uh, in creating effective learning environments based on uh, research and based on effective practice. And so please take advantage uh, of those. They're available uh, and they align with the guidance that we have provided in this document and other uh, guidance that's been provided by the uh, Department of Education. The other set of standards that we point to are the National Standards for Quality Online Teaching. So if you are in an environment now or in the future where you're teaching entirely online, you really need to take a look at these because they give some great specific uh, guidance for how to do online teaching in very uh, effective ways. And, and, and again, no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there are some guides that can be very helpful here. Um, what I want to do now, if you're not familiar, and hopefully neither of these are, are brand new to you, uh, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the ISTE standards, uh, I want to just give a quick example. We have a series of videos that we've created that uh, show what the ISTE standards look like in action. And, and I'd just like to show one of those here. And so we'll go ahead and look at that now. Students contribute constructively to project teams, assuming various roles and responsibilities to work effectively toward a common goal. Global Monster Project, this was a great step to take because things are fairly laid out for you. Teachers from around the world choose a monster part, like we had the ears and the head and the eyes and the eyebrows, the mouth, the tongue, and they make a 12 to 20 word description of that monster part and then they submit it, it's added to a big chart. And then when all the pieces are taken, then it's sent out and every school builds its own monster. Students are now assuming various roles and responsibility. As they're planning, they have to problem solve. Like we had a head, and then the head has to get with the mouth group and decide, is this mouth going to fit onto the head? And how is it gonna fit? And then where would the eyebrows go? Where would the ears, how are you gonna get them to fit? And then all the classes get together and then we start putting the monsters together today in our world, this is how everything's moving. It is working together, working as a team. Many, many, many schools get and do this. And the fun part is the students were looking for different cultures. How are they alike? How are they similar? And they can dig deeper and they can find what interests them. A 
so thank you. I wanted to share that because uh, sometimes when we think about, if you're not familiar with these standards, you think, oh, these are gonna be a bunch of tech standards, you know, how to save files and how to do, these are really focused on using new tech tools, digital tools to engage with students and, and make their learning uh, more powerful and more effective. And, and so if you wanna see more examples of that, you certainly can look online at, at some of the other videos. The one other thing that I wanted to share, and this is a really important one, and, and that is that um, sometimes we've conflated the idea of tool training with effective understanding and professional learning around how to use technology in the classroom. And, uh, and so I wanted to call that out. There are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, different uh, companies that provide training, uh, the, you know, Google certified teachers or, or Microsoft certified, or whatever they are, whatever the, the, the companies are. And, and these are great opportunities. But those are, are uh, learning experiences that are focused on use of particular tools. And so I wanna also make sure that everybody is aware that we have a program called ISTE certification. And that is a program that is completely tool neutral. It's agnostic to the tool and is focused on effective research-based learning principles for using technology in the classroom. It's offered in every state in the country in about 35 countries around the world. And so if you are thinking, if you're a teacher and you're thinking about where you could learn more about the ISTE standards or you're a school leader and you wanna think about how you can provide learning opportunities for uh, your teachers, that's a great opportunity for you. Okay, uh, the next thing I want to do is just talk a little bit about, uh, from now shifting to the student side, how we can create really uh, effective learning experiences for them. And uh, we list, and, and there's much more detail in the guide in all of these, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, uh, but I just want to uh, uh, call some of these out. One is making sure we're looking at really quality use of uh, uh, synchronous and asynchronous instructional time. Technology has taught us that we can do some of both. We don't have to only present online, we don't have to only do it offline, but we can have a nice healthy mix. We talk about um, different developmental considerations, the age of your kids, it matters, and different activities are gonna work better for some uh, or others. Always, no matter what we're doing with technology, we need to keep accessibility front and center. And we need to be making sure that we're using technology in a way that is engaging and motivating for our students. Uh, let me share one other quick uh, video. This actually came from uh, a school in, in, in uh, California, La Cañada uh, School District. And this is how they were working on using technology to engage their students in thinking about digital citizenship in a very effective way. And, and you'll notice here, it's a little different than I think what the traditional approach has been to teaching kids how to be effective uh, digital citizens. So let's go ahead and watch this. A teacher challenged us on the concept of cyberbullying being taught to primary kids, so we began to rethink our approach. We instead thought, what might happen if we taught cyber friendship instead of cyberbullying? We don't really focus on the, the do's and don'ts. We, we talk about scenarios, but in, in a scenario, how to do it the right way. So we talk about all the right ways to do it so that if something ever comes up, well, we already know what to do. So we don't have to focus on, you know, don't do this. And if this happens, this is bad. We don't talk about that as much. It's all the positives. And if you're in a negative situation, here's how to turn it positive. Our goal with Digital Citizenship at Lock and Down Unified is to offer our students the tools and the foundations they need to interact with the world around them. So for us, it's all about identifying those moments that are gonna really be what they need in the future. So that day when we were brainstorming on the ISTE standards for students and we got that challenge from the second grade teacher about cyberbullying, we made this very subtle shift that, that had a tremendous impact. And what I really love is about how obvious this concept is. This is really just about that easy takeaway. We of course would teach about being a good citizen. We of course would teach about being a good online friend and cyber friendship is just that. So we bring this in through lessons on appropriate use, social media and online behavior. And today we wanna to issue the same challenge to all of you. What else might happen if you reframe with the positive? So, so I love that. I just love uh, how the, the team at La Cañada is thinking about flipping to articulating the, the, the skills that we want kids to learn in a digital world instead of just listing all of the don'ts, all the things we did want them not to do, right? Uh, and we give, this is one, uh, one example. There are many other uh, great examples in the, in the guidance that, that talk about uh, you know, where and how we can be uh, using technology in, in, in really transformational ways. 
the last thing that I want to share uh, before handing off to uh, Dr. Martinez, who will talk more about the social emotional learning uh, piece, is I want to talk a little bit about this idea of rethinking assessment. We are in a moment where we have kids who are coming back into our schools. In some cases, kids that we have not heard from in a long time. In other cases, kids that we have, but have been in a, a disruptive learning environment, moving from on and offline. And, and some of the online experience, as we know, was not, you know, was a little rushed as we moved to get online. And so we are in a moment where assessing learning and figuring out where students are and what their needs are and where their strengths and weaknesses are is so important. And it's also a moment that we could be thinking about using these new digital tools for much more authentic assessment. And so in the guide, we talk about using uh, assessment for learning, right? So actually going through the, a process of assessment is a powerful way to learn. Now, I'm not talking about uh, this, you know, kind of boring, ineffective assessments. I, I want you to think about what's possible with technology and what would it look like if we blurred the lines a, lit, a bit between assessing and learning. And, and, and if it was more of an iterative cycle, so we can do some quick checks and see how kids are doing and then provide uh, targeted learning experiences based on those. We also talk about uh, assessment as, uh, as learning. So, so you know, the, the kids are, are going along and, and it's part of their learning process, very similar to the first one. And then finally, assessment of learning, which is at the, at the end, we need to be thinking about uh, how did, uh, did a kid do and, and what do they know? But even this can be very authentic. Uh, it could be the creation of a portfolio using the new technology. It could be an interview that they conduct with somebody or, or a presentation that they create demonstrating their skills. And so the point here is that as we think about the importance of assessment as we come back into the classroom, it's critical that we think about how we can use technology to assess learning in really innovative and powerful ways that are as engaging as as learning experiences, which is truly possible for using technology effectively. So uh, thank you for letting me share a little bit. I'll be back in, in a minute because I'm going to uh, help moderate a bit of a conversation. But right now, I'd like to hand it off uh, to Dr. Martinez, who's going to talk about the social emotional learning and impact and how we can be thinking about that as we move back to the classroom. Dr. Martinez. Thank you so much, Richard, and good morning, everyone. Great to be with all of you this morning. So in chapter three, we focus on providing guidance for how to foster healthy, equitable, and inclusive digital communities through social emotional learning. And we did that through two main focus. One, looking at how we can cultivate educator and student well-being in our digital spaces. And also, more particularly, looking at the social emotional competencies in the castle wheel and thinking about how those can be infused and incorporated in online teaching and learning. Next slide. So when we think about bringing SEL into those digital spaces, we need to think beyond a set curriculum that teachers may teach for 30 minutes once a week in order to really create those inclusive and equitable and equitable spaces, we need to be looking at what are the social and emotional conditions that teachers are intentionally creating in the classroom to support the development of the whole child. And those conditions include for students to feel emotionally and intellectually safe, where they can participate, as Richard was saying, in engaging and challenging instruction, where they receive the supports that they need in order to have their needs met, where there is a, an establishment of meaningful connections with other students and adults, and where they can really grow their social, emotional, and cultural capacity. So looking at those social, emotional conditions will be an important step. Next slide. So one of the first things that I would like to encourage the audience to do is to start by understanding what emotions are and how they impact learning. That is one of the foundation, the foundational blocks of uh, bringing SEL into the digital space. So emotions are complex states of body and mind, and they are generally activated by a stimulus. So once that stimulus, that event has been generated, uh, we go into a process of appraising. Is this negative or positive? Am I under threat? And our bodies and our uh, behavior and thinking processes, they produce an emotional response. So understanding 
how those emotions may impact our students is an important step into bringing SCL into those digital spaces. So we know that emotions drive a person's attention. In any uh, meeting that you have had, if you came preoccupied or there was something that was frustrating to you, you probably had a hard time focusing. It really influences our ability to process information, learn new concepts, and make decisions. According to Dr. Uh, Imordino Yang, it is neurobiologically impossible to make decisions, to engage in complex thought without emotion. So emotions form this critical, this critical piece of how, when, and why people think, remember, and learn. But all emotions are not created equal. When our students come to the uh, Zoom room or to our digital space and they are fearful, or maybe they have experienced adverse childhood um, experiences, they have experienced trauma, or they are overcome by challenging emotions, it's gonna be very hard for students to focus and their learning is gonna be impacted. So some of the things that we do by integrating SCL into this space is by helping students to process those emotions so they have uh, what they need in order to move forward. Next slide. So in the guidance, we provide strategies for how educators can incorporate emotions in the virtual classrooms. So for example, by giving students choice and helping them relate the, relate the materials discussed in class to their life and personal interests. And these two strategies are related to the fact that the brain doesn't pay attention to things that are not interesting to us, right? So we really, our brains are really trying to be effective and not waste any energy. So the more that we can connect what we present to students to the interest, that means that we that students can be more engaged and more uh, involved in the learning process. Uh, providing opportunities to solve open-ended problems. When we offer students activities that are very prescriptive, those tend to be emotionally impoverished. That means that students don't have the opportunity to establish the emotional connections that they need in order to engage in that deeper learning. We want to make sure we are offering a variety of tasks and activities to keep the brain awake um, and, and paying attention and being able to engage meaningfully with the learning content. And finally, we want to make sure that we are allowing students the opportunity to check in about their emotions and creating the space for them to refocus. And this is related to the fact that we want to normalize uh, talking about emotions in our classrooms, emotions as we saw really impact learning. So anything that we can do as educators to make sure that students have that opportunity to check in with themselves, to name their emotions is gonna help them to engage more purposefully with the academic content. Next slide, please. So a key finding in the science of learning and, and development is that children's relationships with adults are an essential ingredient for learning and healthy development. And these positive relationships create these developmental pathways for lifelong learning. And they allow students to adapt and integrate their social, emotional, and cognitive skills. And we know that the quality of the student and teacher relationship has been repeatedly linked to students' academic, social, and emotional outcomes. So we want to make sure that even if we are in a digital space, that we are um, emphasizing and leading with the importance of relationships to creating that space for students to be seen, to feel, to feel seen, um, loved, and cared for. So in the guidance, we provide some strategies on how educators can nurture those positive relationships. And just to share a couple of examples with you today, um, educators can routinely engage students in team building activities so students get to know each other and they have the opportunity to know their teacher where they are 
building and nurturing that emotional connection among students. Um, another strategy could be to co-create the norms and expectations with your students. Um, going back to that idea of digital, digital citizenship, how we can create a space where students are coming together and respecting each other and asking how do they want to feel in that digital space? What would be helpful for them to experience in order to support their learning? Next slide, please. So from years starting the implementation of SEL in schools, we know that the SEL skills of the adults matter and they actually matter a lot. I often say that teachers cannot teach what they don't practice. So we need to make sure that educators have that opportunity to examine how they are showing up in that digital space, how they are using their own social emotional skills in the classroom and model them for their students more intentionally. We know that um, based on the research that has been done that adult SEL skills really influence the learning environment. So teacher social and emotional competencies influence that teacher and student quality, the quality of that relationship. And teachers model those SCL skills intentionally or not. Even in the Zoom room, our students are watching us when there's something that happens with technology and we get frustrated or the lesson is not going the way that we were hoping. Our students are watching how we respond and they learn from that. So even when we think, oh, they are not watching, oh yes, they are watching. And then teacher social emotional skills also influence that classroom organization and management. Again, if you as an educator, you can stay calm, even when things are not going as expected, or if you are having challenges, the organization of your virtual classroom and how you manage all the different pieces of technology to make learning engaging and meaningful, it's going to really support you if you have that practice of your SEL skills at the forefront. But the thing is that educators cannot do this alone. We need school and district administrator support in creating that space uh, where we can support educators to be effective, to build those adult connections. So adults are able to enjoy that same positive environment uh, from a work perspective and also to support their well-being in the long term. If there's something that we have learned through this pandemic is that we need to pay attention to that well-being. Teachers are feeling uh, burnout. They are feeling the weight of the working conditions. So anything that administrators can do to support the well-being of teachers, that is also bringing SCL into that digital space. Next slide, please. So many of you are probably familiar with the five social emotional comp competencies created by CASEL, by the, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning. And they are represented by a wheel which places SEL at the center or, or hub, surrounded by five core competencies. Um, the first two, self-awareness and self-management are related to our interpersonal skills. Then we have social awareness and relationship skills, which are related to our interpersonal skills. And finally, responsible decision making, which is related to more our cognitive skills. And these social emotional skills are represented as spokes in this uh, wheel of SEL. So in the guidance, we describe how these five core competencies can be infused in virtual classrooms through three key strategies. So using self-management as an example, our first strategy, teaching SEL competencies explicitly. And this is a time when teachers would be teaching uh, these skills in a, in a very explicit way. So for example, teachers could be teaching and incorporating mindfulness and self-soothing exercises to help students navigate their feelings. Um, they could be teaching students to recognize what are the physical signs that indicate that the body is going into stress mode. Then moving into the second strategy, using teaching practices that enhance students' SCL skills. And this means that educators are looking at their teaching practice and seeing 
what are the opportunities that I have as an educator to bring SCL into that digital space? So for example, they could do incorporate feedback loops into their instruction where students reflect on their behaviors and their choices, or they could implement quiet time, a time when students can do a quiet activity to refocus and be able to, um, to, be, to get ready for learning. And finally, the third one is integrating SCL with academic content. And this is probably my favorite one. So when you are looking at academic content in the example of mathematics, uh, you can help students to discover their negative self-talk. If they are sending themselves messages that are negative, that can be impacting their learning. So making sure that students are able to notice that and reframing could be a way to integrate SEL with academic content. And these are just some examples, many more in the guidance. And I would just close by saying that at the core, SEL is how we are with, with each other, how we show up in that uh, virtual classroom, and also that SEL is good teaching. So anything that you can do to support students using their social emotional skills to access that academic learning, uh, you are truly planting the seeds for, for more meaningful learning and to grow healthy adults. So thank you so much for joining us today and I'll pass it uh, back to Richard. Thanks, Luria. That is uh, such great, uh guidance for us to be thinking about, uh, especially as we're, as you know, your, your reminder that uh, it matters for the adults in the system too. And if we're not able to model the behavior that we want our kids to learn, it's going to be very hard for them to do it. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I want to shift now and invite uh, two uh, really fantastic leaders to uh, join the conversation. Uh, the first is uh, Sofia Mendoza, who is the Instructional Technology Initiative, ITI, Director at Los Angeles Unified, and uh, Sonal Patel, who is the uh, Digital Learning Innovation Coordinator at San Bernardino County uh, Superintendent's uh, Office. And so uh, welcome to both of you. Um, would love to just start by asking your thoughts and opinions on on this, uh, some of these issues that we've talked about. Let me start with this. Um, it, <laughs> we have made a significant investment in technology uh, over this last, you know, 18 months or so. What are some suggestions you could each give us on how to make sure that investment is really being used in ways that are really uh, effective and transformational in this coming school year? I can, I can go first. Go for uh, it. Jump hi in. Everyone. Uh, my name is Sonal, Sonal, as Richard just mentioned, and I'm so honored to be here as a member of the Digital Learning Advisory Committee. In order to answer the, the question that Richard just posed, um, I'd say it's very important that we promote the active learning experiences that we want our students to uh, be exposed to uh, while they transition back to the classroom or continue to be in the online setting. And part of that involves building that student agency, ensuring that students are involved in the learning process through goal setting or from, for, from even uh, providing feedback uh, to educators about what they would like to see within their own learning model. Um, and honoring that the diverse learning styles of our students and not just di diverse learning styles, but also the di diverse learners that are in our classroom, while we provide that personalized educational experience for our students is going to be central to how we, um, how we transform the learning environment in the classroom. One example that I want to share for, for, with you uh, from San Bernardino County is a school district over here, Fontana Unified School District, that are currently exploring different uh, blended learning models. Uh, for example, the station rotation model where the teacher, the educator gets gets an opportunity to work in small groups, to use data meaningfully with students, to provide that personalized, culturally responsive instruction for, for our students as students are engaging in meaningful tasks with the use of technology in their centers. And one of those meaningful tasks might be a small group, uh, uh, you know, that is working on working through a hyperdoc or a hypernote where students are going through lesson design elements and are engaged in learning models that scaffold instruction for each of the diverse learners in our classroom. So just intentional use of the technology in, in designing learning experiences that are accessible by all. And pass it over to Sophia to add to that. Great, um, I know we heard a little bit about this from you earlier, Richard, around how important 
professional development, professional learning is, you know, that's what I'd like to add on to um, the additional comments here is that how critical, I mean, not only did we have a huge investment in, in the things, right, in the tech, um, but we also, let's not forget about that huge investment in professional development for our, all of our educators, right? Not only our classroom teachers, but our executive leaders and our on-site ed leaders. Let's not forget about that. So um, continuing that investment in professional development that is not only robust, but relevant for the context in which we're in, you know, Right now, this moment, LA Unified, we're, we are back face-to-face -face with an option of some online um, independent study work, um, but we can't forget all that was learned over the last year and a half in our professional development settings, especially around the design of UDL, Universal Design for Learning, at the center around all of our professional development experiences, um, you know, and I've seen so many successful and effective examples over this last year and a half. And in addition to that, just, you know, we have only, we're in week two here in LA Unified uh, for our fall semester. There's so many that I would love to like highlight everyone, um, but I'm not able to do that. I don't want to leave out anyone out. So I invite you all to the dedicated LA Unified Twitter handle, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, it's at ITI underscore LAUSD. Here, we've strategically showcased the effective use of technology. I get that question all the time. Well, what does it look like? What should I be looking for? Or what should I be teaching my students? So um, again, the, the handle is um, at ITI underscore LAUSD. Again, it's showcasing these effective use of technology. You'll see examples of how our educators are integrating effective learning strategies with our most youngest learners. You'll see the two-year-olds, you'll see the four-year-olds uh, in early ed and in secondary. You'll also observe how students are, you know, learning phonemic awareness strategies, skills and dispositions, those foundations how middle grade students are utilizing game-based learning for civic engagement, as well as how high school students are imagining, creating, and sharing, it's really important, their ethical apps that they're creating in their computer science courses. There's also um, three hashtags I'll put in the chat also, um, empowered by ITI, um, hashtag DigCitLA, and hashtag CS for LAUSD. Again, I don't wanna leave anyone out. That's why I wanna invite you to the ITI underscore LAUSD Twitter handle along with these additional three hashtags um, that you can kind of dig in and dive in for yourself. Awesome, Sophia, thank you so much. I'm coming back in a second because I wanna follow up on, on a couple of things you mentioned, but, but Sona, let me pull you back in for a second here. And uh, you know, we talk a lot about the importance of, of the student learning experience. Of course we do, that's the center of what we do. But we also have to recognize that leaders matter, right? And if we don't have leaders that are effectively prepared to lead in a digital world, uh, the student experience is, is going to suffer. And so what thoughts or advice do you have for the, the leaders that may be watching this on what their role can and should be? How are you helping them get ready to lead a very different, uh, very digital learning environment? That's a great question, Richard. Thank you. Because as you know, you know, part of my role here at the county is engaging our leaders in very important conversations. And I think part of it is what Sophia mentioned, that professional development and, and engaging our stakeholders and our educators in conversations about what personalized professional development could look like. Uh, one example of that is the leading edge certification course that we offer at um, our county and many different county offices that offer a, a, a new model of certification where uh, educators can go on and asynchronously, asynchronously participate in a course and receive a micro credential and, you know, through choice based, based uh, bite sized activities. Uh, educators are able to take uh, any pathways that they wish to take in order to develop their, their own capacity. Uh, and so just being open as leaders uh, with regards to the types of professional learning opportunities that are out there, not just with Leading Edge, but also with ISTE, as well as um, um, trying to infuse different models of professional learning within, within their own setting is going to be uh, super instrumental in, in how we engage our, our stakeholders. 
Um, and in addition to that, I have to mention that there is an ABLE guide, uh, which, is, which stands for Accessible Blended Learning Education, linked into the Digital Learning Guide. It was developed by some outstanding members of our CISC, which is the Curriculum and Instruction Steering Committee for Digital Learning and Computer Science Integration. And they did a, a, an amazing job of developing key areas of focus for educators to engage in professional learning that is set up as a digital escape room. So I'm very excited for you to delve into that. that I'll add that the link to that, the direct link to, to that into the chat window, but you can also access it from the guide. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, um, one of the things that's come up, and, and I really, Sonal, it's so important that you said, like, just don't, there are resources that are available here. We don't have to be inventing all this from scratch. I know we've all sort of said that, but if there's one message to take away, uh, you know, that's, that's it. And so that's a really, a really critical one. Um, Sophie, let me go back to you for a second. And we, uh, you know, ISTE over the last uh, couple months has had a great opportunity to work with uh, LA Unified to create a strategic plan for using technology effectively. And that's been a, a great experience. Along that process, we got to learn a little bit about some of the work you've been doing around digital citizenship and how you're teaching it. Will you just say a sentence or two about your approach? Because I think that would be helpful for some of the other uh, uh, districts here to hear. Sure, yes. Um... You know, thank you for that collaboration because over the last two years here in LA Unified, we have seen the practice of digital citizenship really evolving. Um, yes, all the while, safety, security, privacy, that's been at the, at the core, at the foundation. But what we're seeing now is how this evolution of digital citizenship is now expanding and integrating into civic engagement, but also I wanna to touch on what Lorea shared earlier around social emotional learning. Most recently, um, we could, well, I'll say recently, <laughs> uh, maybe within the last um, eight months, we've taken this approach where we're integrated digital citizenship and restorative practices to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. What we've been able to do is take the five digit competencies of inclusion, informed, engaged, balanced, and alert, um, being a member of the DigiSit Commit Coalition and purposefully layering in the principles of restorative practices. Really essentially, educators are intentionally engaging in these positive interactions in, within the digital space with a focus on building relationships and restoring these really critical um, relationships that they're going to need to have, especially coming back into um, our, our previous setting. Yeah, thank you. That's that's really, that's fantastic. I appreciate that. And I think this is the moment to rethink and get us out of the, the don'ts approach to digital citizenship, right? Instead of listing all the don'ts, but how to do it in a positive way. And you guys have just done such a great job of that. Um, Tonal, in the last two minutes that we have, I'm going to give you the last word here. And what I'd love to ask is, you know, if you can think about um, we've seen historically after moments of uh, major disruption, uh, there's often a bloom in innovation, right? It's a pattern that, that we see. And so even though this has been a very disruptive last 18 months, uh, it's an opportunity moving forward for us to really rethink and redesign the future of learning. Part of that comes from learning from this, this time of disruption. And so I'd love for you to end with, this is a two part, is what is... Uh, one uh, uh, thing that you learned during the last 18 months that you want to not forget and, and how can we all that are listening here leverage th that thing that you learned to help make learning better for, uh, for our kids this coming year? Another great question, Richard. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the, the key things that came out of this, this last year was uh, the the whole uh, ensuring that we are being inclusive in our learning design models, uh, especially in the digital setting where we can make an impact on how, how 
accessible our, our learning content is for students online. And I think part of that is, uh, you know, ensuring that we are mindful of culturally responsive instruction that does value the diversity of our classroom settings. It's truly a beautiful thing in incorporating students' backgrounds and interests into the experiences that we're designing within our classrooms and involving students in conversations and discussions about critical issues that are happening in our world today. Um, and also, uh, you know, connecting, connecting our students uh, to uh, so many more people through the online setting, as well as building that community uh, not just online, but within our classroom settings. I think building community has been a, a key aspect of, of that digital setting uh, that, that came out you know, over this year about how important that was for not just social emotional learning, but also for us to be more inclusive and, and to, to connect with our students and to truly understand what engages and motivates our students. I really love the four areas uh, that have been uh, written about in the guide, including the aggregating quality asynchronous material, developing considerations um, that are, you know, developmental considerations, accessibility, and thinking about ways in which we can engage our learners. I think those are all going to be instrumental in the way we design learning activities. Um, and I think it's just always going to be very important to remember that there are very different professional learning models that we can engage our educators in. Agreed. Thank you. You've given us some good uh, some good homework uh, to think about as we as we move forward. Sanal and Sophia, you're doing amazing work. Thank you for your leadership and your example. I wish we could talk all day. We do need to wrap up, but but I appreciate your insights and thank you for being here with us today. Dr. Rota, let me hand it back to you now, and uh, you can you can help wrap us up here. Okay. Well, let me again just thank both Sophia and Sonal for sharing their perspectives and most importantly, their ideas about how we will take our learning to continue to refine our approach and the use of technology in the classroom setting. If I could go to the, if you can go to the next slide, what I'd like to just end on is to reiterate what you've just heard. And that is that this guidance document focuses on the integration of technology in any setting, whether it's an in-person setting or working in a virtual and environment through independent studies. So know that this is applicable to all educators. This slide here provides an overview of what is included in the supplemental materials and the appendices. We have included a, a glossary of key terms, references. We also have appendices and Appendix A includes a full literature review that was conducted by ISTE for this project that began the efforts here. Appendix B includes digital, it's a digital tools matrix that organizes a variety of di digital tools referenced in the guide. And most of these, these tools are largely derived from the interviews that were conducted with California educators. Appendix C includes a list of resources for each section to support the implementation of these strategies. And section appendix D includes sample rubrics for mathematics developed by Dr. Bowler and Kathy Williams. Next slide. We're very pleased to share with you that we have moved into phase two. Now that we have the online, uh, web, uh, uh, online document that is a, a, a document that's available in a word format, we are in the process of working with ISTE to ensure that this 550 page document becomes a much more user-friendly tool for educators. So we are creating a digital version of this document, which includes not only a PDF, but we are also exploring the development of an ebook. To house all of these resources and materials, ISTE is also working to develop a website. And this website will help ensure that teachers can access all of these sections by content area, by grade level. So it will be a very user-friendly website to focus in on the areas of interest for educators and both teachers as well as administrators and others. The website will include videos of not only our content experts who develop the content, but also teachers who, have, who throughout California who were interviewed 
for these videos. In the coming months, we will be working with a variety of our partners, our CSESA partners, our geographic leads throughout the state, as well as our statewide system of support to ensure that we disseminate this information widely. We'll also be, of course, working closely with ISTE and Q to ensure wide dissemination of this project. So I'd like to end by just thanking all of you for joining us today. This will be posted on the website and I will turn it over to Dr. Mike Torres to talk about next steps. Thank you so much, Dr. Hirota, panelists and presenters for sharing your knowledge and insights on the guidance. Um, and at this time, we are out of time for this webinar. It looks like we've been able to answer the Q&A uh, questions and answers throughout the presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available on the CDE website in the upcoming weeks. We, we would like to remind you that we do have one more webinar in this series. Webinar three is actually this afternoon, Mathematics Standards Guidance. To, uh, this afternoon at 2 p.m., the focus is on Section B, Standards Guidance for Mathematics. You can register at HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash bit dot lee forward slash three w z j six t b and you can follow us at cde curriculum on twitter thank you for joining us today we wish you all a happy and healthy school year